I'd now like to invite our next speaker, Joe Talcott. I will begin by not trying to hide my excitement of being on the most famous stage in the world, a stage which promotes ideas worth spreading, and that our uh, venue here today, each one of you are part of a much bigger network of TED and TEDx events going on around the world every day. So uh, uh, thanks for coming tonight. I will, however, tell you maybe some disconcerting news that there is the chance that those ideas worth spreading are being put in danger. And uh, I want to talk to you about the battle for your creative brain. Because there is a battle going on right now that will stem our individual creativity. And these combatants are acting covertly, oftentimes disguised as just benign influences, and even more often disguised as your friends. This battle is a fierce battle. It's a high stakes battle. And it is most assuredly a personal battle. And if you're like many people, you may be losing this battle. Now today, I am going to be happy to unveil a secret weapon that you can employ against these combatants that are trying to limit your own creativity. A secret weapon that I will explain soon enough. But first, maybe some definitions. There are two words that we almost take for granted, creativity and idea. What is creativity? What is an idea? Lynn, this one is for you. Uh, philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, in his 1818 book called The World as Will and Idea, opened with one of the best opening lines of a book I've ever read when he said, the world is my idea. Now, I must tell you that the rest of the book is not very practical. It's philosophical. Um, and I suppose that's because he was a philosopher. But if you look and try to explore uh, what's going on here, it does make us question some of the fundamentals that we thought we already knew. What is an idea? I searched uh, a lot of places, and the one that I prefer comes from this man. Make sure I get his name right. James Webb Young. He worked uh, for the advertising agency J. Walter Thompson in the 1940s. He's in the Advertising Hall of Fame. Here's how he describes an idea. An, a, an idea is nothing more or nothing less than a new combination of old elements. So simple. Let me give you an example. About 6,000 years ago, this appeared in the world. I'm sure you all recognize it as the first blueberry bagel. <laughs> well, okay, it isn't that, but it, it looks a bit like that. This represents the invention of the wheel, and clearly, this invention changed the world. 4,000 years later, archaeologists discovered this. Now, the, the item in the middle is made out of leather. It has a Latin inscription on the front, and the holes around the outside are where leather bands held the whole thing together. What was it? Well, it was a bag that Roman soldiers could carry in which they could put their essentials, as they traveled off to conquer new countries. Today, we might say it was the world's first man bag. Let's go another 2,000 years ahead, and we get a new combination of old elements. Now, who would have thought that it would take 2,000 years <laughs> to decide to put wheels on a suitcase? 
I must point out, when the idea first came out, it was rejected by people at department stores because the first, one, the first suitcase with wheels was a regular suitcase, four wheels on it, and you pulled it with a strap. And the buyer said, no one is going to purchase this because men don't want to be seen pulling their own suitcase. Now, the version that you see on the screen behind me is the second iteration of that idea that luckily didn't take another 2,000 years. So when we talk about an idea and using that simple definition, we, we recognize that humans are pretty good at this. We're pretty good at seeing patterns in things, mixing things up, putting disconnected uh, elements together to form an idea. Then, as was pointed out, when the ideas come to you, you just jot them down. The jotting is simplicity itself. It's the occurring which is the difficult part. And I will point out that that is the part that is currently under attack. How do ideas occur? Now, many of you may have seen this little sheet of paper on your chair when you came in, and you were given a chance to write down where and in what circumstances you felt most creative. Did anyone write anything down? Yes, where, where was it? Would you shout out as loud as you can? In peace, in nature. Very good. Is there anyone else? In the shower in the morning. Very good. Lots of people report that one. So let's talk about if anybody wrote this down. <laughs> How about this? Perhaps this. <laughs> well, probably not. So let's talk about your brain. Well, not your specifically, but let's talk about brains uh, uh, that, that, humans, uh, that humans have. The human brain and the computer are somewhat similar. The which came first is easy. It was the human brain, and the computer was fashioned after it. The, our brains have a huge capacity. Paul Reber from Northwestern University in Illinois, in the U.S., writing in Scientific American, estimated the memory size of our brains at about, at about 2.5 petabytes. Let me read this so I get it right. That is clearly a huge capacity. It's about a million gigabytes or to put it in more common terms, about 3 million hours of television, which is probably getting close to what you watched during the COVID lockdown. <laughs> but whilst our brains have this huge amount of memory, we have a limited amount of processing power, and we have a limited amount of energy to power our, blame, our brains. So when we're trying to you know, generate an idea, our brain goes to work, it looks at all these different combinations, it tries to put them together. But because it's hard for the processor to work, it often has to multitask. And so, task one, come up with a new idea. Maybe an idea worth spreading. Task two, everything else in your life. <laughs> And if, again, you're like most people, oftentimes you have to force quit to come up with an idea application in order to manage the everything else in my life application. Now, ideas don't come in a linear way. They just don't go one, two, three, here's the idea. And I think um, when you read the, uh, the quote from uh, Dr. Fleming, things come in almost a digital way. It's here, it's there, and we have to try to sort those out and put them together. Which brings me to how we might defend against this attack on our creativity. <clears throat> you know, a few years ago, if you would run into a former colleague outside of your place of work, the conversation might go something like this. Well, how good to see you. I didn't expect to see you here. Yes, nice to see you too. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well, too. How are things at work? Uh, pretty good. Today, the same two people meet. How are you doing? Great. How are you? 
I'm very good. How are things at work? What do you think the next word is? Well, in my uh, investigations, I find that this one is quite common. I'm very busy. Very, very busy. And this is part of the problem. It's because creativity is a free-range activity. It, it grows and becomes stronger in the open air. But when it's, when it's just fenced in by the barbed wire of daily tasks, it can't get out. It can't do all of those comparisons. And I will tell you that this is a weapon of our enemy. The enemy has deployed weapons of mass distraction. Do you recognize any of these? <laughs> no one was saying this is where the great ideas came from. Now, I regret to tell you that the weapons of mass distraction list is only getting bigger. And it calls our attention. The people that are serving you these things are trying to seduce you into spending time with them away from your daily tasks and away from your idea forming. And because they make money with the amount of time they spend with you, they're not pulling back on any of this. Busy is the enemy of creativity. What is the antidote? It is space. And somebody already said that. You know, that's when you're away from the... <clears throat> from all the technology of the world, when you're on the open nature, this is a fantastic place to be creative. Space to allow your memory to search thousands, maybe millions of different elements, and put them together in different combinations. Now, you might rightly challenge me on that and say, wait a minute, I am busy at work. You know, I, I, I can't put on my CV that I just spend a lot of time in thought. Um, and we ha I have things to get done. So let me, let me challenge that a bit by giving you a story about some people who were in incredible busy situation, but dug out space for creativity, literally dug out space. 77 years ago, one of the biggest battles of World War II took place in a little town called Anzio. It was a horrific, horrific battle. For 120 days, the battlefield was shelled every day. It was like World War I, but with bigger guns. Now, as many of you may know, if you were serving in the army and you write home to your loved ones, you can't give them specifics of what you're doing because those letters could fall into the wrong hands. In this case, someone writing from the Anzio beachhead wrote home, and I'll highlight this section. You may have heard that we're a bit busy here. That has to be the understatement of the century. I have never been that busy. But in all of this, soldiers found a way, usually at night when the guns were quiet, to collect materials and create pieces from uh, shell casings with the little tools they had and created art while they were busy during the day. This soldier made a ring from his experience on it, Anzio uh, Beachhead. The front, you can see the name of the town. On the side, 44, designating the year. And on the other side of the ring, ME109, which indicated where the materials for this ring came. And that was from a Messerschmitt 109 aircraft that had been shot down, the ring being constructed out of aluminum or aluminum. I looked at the weight of this ring and to see what the value of it was. The ring is worth about one U.S. cent. But let me tell you that I would not sell this ring for any amount of money. 
because the man that wrote the letter and made the ring was my father. And in 1998, when he passed away, I inherited the ring. Today, it reminds me of two things. First and foremost, of my dad. And secondly, that there is nowhere too busy to create a space for you to create ideas. Now, there is a creativity paradox. You do need all kinds of elements in order to match them into a new idea. But it requires space at the same time, and that needs to be managed. One of the most creative brains of the 20th century put it this way. The monotony of a quiet life stimulates the creative mind. And then Albert Einstein added rather wryly, scientists might be employed as lighthouse keepers. So they could devote themselves undisturbed to thinking. So here's the good news. In this battle for your creative brain, you can fight back. First, expand your idea universe, the elements. Fill your mind with all kinds of things. Read as much as you can. Travel when you're again able. Try new things. Watch more TED Talks. Define the problem that you're trying to solve. It's a good starting point, really. Plan for space. It won't come to you. It won't come to you without you taking some action. Say no to the distractors. Turn off notifications. Turn off your email. Turn off your phone, your iPad, your all the other devices that we now own. And allow your mind to do what it has done from the very beginning. A few years ago, well, probably more than a few, Apple introduced its new iPhone 3. And the ad they ran for it went something like this. It was talking about their apps. Do you want to know how many calories are in your lunch? There's an app for that. Just touch a button. Do you want to know where your car is parked? There's an app for that. Just touch a button. Skiing conditions? There's an app for that. Just touch a button. Which brings us to the secret weapon I promised to reveal. You want to be more creative? There's an app for that. Just touch a button. The off button. Tune out, turn off, drop everything, and let your brain be creative. Make new combinations. And if you do these things, I tell you, you will think all kinds of wonderful things that maybe you haven't just had the time to do in the past. Now, if you can't do those things, there is an alternative. Item six, perhaps you just relocate. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat>